<laughs> if, if you have the opportunity to do it, do it. Very little in life is terminal except death. Yeah. Um, you can recover from stuff. I'm living proof. I've recovered from a lot of stuff. And, you know, I, I try to, when, when I make a stupid mistake, learn from it. And that's, I think, what life is all about. When we live in a world where we don't really fit in, walking our own path can be challenging. And while it's easy to know where we don't belong, finding where we do is oftentimes a lot harder. Anthony's life has taken him to many different places. All places where he didn't belong, but always helped him get closer to where he was truly meant to be. Anthony is the owner of Point Six Four where he helps his clients tell their authentic stories through a variety of creative services. He shares with us his wild journey and talks about how he created a life that is truly reflective of how he wants to live every day. Anthony, thank you for being here. Aaron, thanks for having me. Um, so we've been meaning to do this for a while. Yeah. So I'm glad that we finally got in. I was just on your podcast a few weeks ago. Um, but I'm really excited because... You and I are super similar. Like, I think when we initially met, I started making all these dots of like, oh, me too, me too, me too. So whenever you said this earlier, we can talk for hours yeah. because we're going through the same thing. I mean, career, there's a lot of yeah. overlap. Well, and- I feel like what we're about to do, we've done in 20-minute iterations about 20 different times. <laughs> yeah. We just have really good conversations. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested, you know, with everything, starting kind of early at the beginning because, you know, who we are as kids, the family we raised, and all of that is such a precursor for the tendencies we have and some of the interests and all of that. And, you know, as we talk about business and entrepreneurship, I love exploring all the way back because it makes so much more sense as to how people end up the way they do. Yeah. So start me off. Tell me, what was your childhood like? What was those early days for you like? Yeah. So I grew up in Massachusetts in a suburb, north suburbs of Boston. I was the youngest of four kids, very much middle class, you know, kind of what you'd expect growing up in the 70s and early 80s. Um, there were two things that, that shaped me as a kid that, as you suggest, kind of still manifest himself today. Number one was there was, a, there was a challenge in my family that made me super anxious as a kid and a little angry, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then I was just absolutely off the charts, ADHD. Mm-hmm. A lot of energy, not a lot of good places to put that energy. So I got in a lot of trouble as a kid. Um, fortunately, didn't do a lot of harm to other people, but nevertheless got in a lot of trouble. So, you know, what, what happened to, with me early on is the challenges in my family made school sort of an afterthought. Mm-hmm. Um, I was a combination of not focused thinking about other things that to me were bigger issues than school. School was kind of a joke to me, and I didn't like being told what to do. And school in the 70s and 80s is all about telling people what to do. Yeah. So I I was the world's worst student, make no mistake about it, and proved that for about 12 years and, and beyond. W- what ended up happening to, to benefit me is I was surrounded by people who, fortunately for me, it was about the only advantage I had, I was surrounded by people who were either headed to college or knew what they wanted. So I had some good tailwind in the people I surrounded myself with, friends and my siblings. So for lack of knowing what else to do, I ended up going to college right after high school. And when I say I didn't know what I want to do, wanted to do, and when I say I had a short attention span, the best way I can describe it is this, and this is only kind of a joke. When it came to picking a major, I think I landed on accounting because it was first on the list. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, sure, I'll do that. That one. Yeah, that sounds like an, a job an adult has. So an accounting major I was, and it was an unmitigated disaster. My first, <laughs> <laughs> my first semester of college, two Fs, a D minus, a D, and a C minus. Wow. So that's 0.64 GPA. So at this point... You mentioned when you were young, unfocused, all these things, couldn't pay attention. Yeah. Did that follow you all the way through college? It did. It did. And to some extent follows me to to today. I've just learned how to manage it a little bit more. Yeah. When I was – one of the things I realized um, later in life is I 
didn't know how to read in that I would be looking at the pages of a book and thinking about something else. Mm. So I would finish a book not having really comprehended any of it, but I was like, well, I'm done. And I never really paid attention to what was on the page because I had this world going on in my head that was distracting me. So you went through the motion, but Correct. didn't comprehend. Correct. I turned the page and didn't read any of it. So that obviously held me back. You know, and, and I my day used to look like this as a kid. I would go to school and kind of go through the motions. I would get home and I would be kind of on guard because of that anxiety. Then my time to myself was I would usually watch TV. Like when I was in, when I was in middle school and high school, it's when David Letterman first came out. I would watch David Letterman, and then I would watch Charlie Rose, which was a current, current events program, until like 4 in the morning. Mm. And then I would go to bed, for I would sleep for a few hours, and then I'd go to school. And you wonder why I was a D student throughout <laughs> high school, because I didn't get any sleep. Yeah. And I was pretty good at current events because of Charlie Rose, but that was how I lived my life up until the end of high school. So, um, you know, the first semester goes really badly. Then I do the first intelligent thing I ever did as a student, and that was decide to take a semester off and just kind of regroup. And I thought what was going to happen is an answer was magically going to come to me about, here's what you should do with your life, mm. and, you know, here's how you should change this. And it didn't, but for lack of any other options, I re-enrolled, same college, fall of 1988, and I did better. But as Tim Borney once told me, you can't fall off the floor, so of course yeah. I did better. But it was only marginally better. And at that point, I was on the verge of getting thrown out of a school that's really hard to get thrown out of mm. and decided – well, I think I'm going to take another semester off because if not, it might be imposed upon so me. It's not, it's not working out. You're pushing, but... Correct. Correct. And the entire time, I mean, I had I was paying my own way through college. So I'm working, you know, working bartending jobs and working in restaurants. So I'm making money, but I'm not making any progress. And I get to fall of 1989 when I should be two years into college. And I've literally only earned enough credit for a few classes. And what happens is I start to see all my peers starting to make real progress. I'm like, oh, they, they have an idea what they want to do and they're moving towards it. And I'm getting left behind. Yeah. And I was like, oh shit, I haven't made any progress and I got to start figuring this out. And I really didn't want to. <laughs> but then in the fall of 1989, I said, okay, I'm going to give this one more shot. I, I had contemplated dropping out of school, contemplated doing something different, but I had no other answer. I literally was like, I don't, I have no idea what I would do. So I went back in the fall of 1989, but I, but two really pieces of good luck hit in that semester. Number one was that I decided to go back part-time at night. And I was surrounded by adult students, people who had jobs, they had families, and they weren't going to, you know, put up with a lot of crap. So I didn't have an audience for my teen angst anymore. Gotcha. It was kind of like, oh, these people are all super motivated. And I think I just kind of learned something from that. The other thing that happened that was super lucky is that I had a writing class with a professor named Bruce Gilman. And I turned in an early assignment and he said, you know, this is pretty good. You're a pretty good writer. And that was like the first positive reinforcement mm. I had ever had as a student. And I was like, oh, that feels pretty good. I think I want to do that. I think I want to be a writer. And I changed my major to English. And then I was off to the races. And I did pretty well in school after that. So I, I, I really believe that that moment, just having a teacher say, I see something in you that you don't see in yourself, changed my life. And after that, the trajectory of what was possible for me changed dramatically. Still didn't know what I wanted to do, yeah. but I said, okay, this writing thing seems to be the only skill I have, so I'm going to double down on that. Well, you know, and I think something that's interesting is, number one, having someone believe and push is super important. You know, talk about Karen Gilly all the time, yeah. Anthes being able yeah. to do that. But the other thing is, I mean, when you were a kid, there wasn't nearly as much information about ADHD or yeah. different learning styles, sure. right? It was... You come in and you do this. Yeah. So, you know, when you try and do things in a way that isn't natural to you, I mean, the interest thing is super important because I'm the same way. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that great in college because I don't care about art history. Yeah. yeah. I don't care yeah. about whatever paper you want me to write. I want to be in Photoshop designing. That's what yeah. I'm here for. Yeah. And that's what Anthus gave me because that's all it was. Yeah. And then when I went to college, it was kind of like, 
oh, I just I just can't. I ended up dropping out because that last semester was full of so much crap that I'm like, I don't need to know that. I don't need to know that in a time when I already had clients. Yeah. So it was like, for me, it's like, if it, if I don't know how it's going to help me, mm-hmm. I just I just can't focus on it. 100%. I, I've described myself as someone who, if I'm interested in what you're talking to me about, I'm the most interested person mm-hmm. you're ever going to find. If I'm not, I'm the least interested person you're ever going to find. And school for me was being told to sit still, which I don't do well, mm. being told what to do, which I hate, mm. and studying a lot of stuff that I had no interest in. It's no wonder why I didn't do well. Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised I even graduated, quite honestly. So, you know, it was only when I had the opportunity to have more latitude in what I focused on that I started to turn myself around. So talk to me a little bit about that. What happens? You start to do a little bit better. Mm-hmm. You start to go in a direction. Where, what happens next? Yeah, so I complete a bachelor's degree at then Salem State College, now Salem State University. Still have no idea what I want to do. Um, literally no idea, like, okay, I'm an English major, now what? Um, but I got a job at the Massachusetts Port Authority as the Certificate of Insurance Coordinator in the Risk Management Department, which is just as exciting as it sounds. It's a mouthful. And it was a job, right? But here's, I, I had such a chip on my shoulder, I was like, well, anyone who does a nine-to-five job, one of these bullshit jobs, they must yeah. be a jerk. And I ran into people, I'm like, oh, this guy's kind of great. And he does what I used to think was a bullshit job. Stop being an asshole, Anthony. You know, you can have a career and actually do productive things, and it doesn't mean you're selling out to the man, right? Mm -hmm. So I was surrounded by people who, again, and and this is my whole story, is positive reinforcement through relationships, is I said, okay, I, I know how to go to work. And I actually figured out, oh, I'm someone who I show up on time, and I do, you know, what I'm supposed to do at work. If, if I'm interested or motivated, and really the only thing motivating me at that point was a paycheck, but I also, I, I still have and always had an aspect of myself that's very much a people pleaser. And mm-hmm. I think it comes from as a kid having severely low self-esteem. It was, I want to make other people happy, right? So that was part of what motivated me. But it wasn't like I'd found my career goal. I was doing a job that was just a job. Things changed again when my son's mom Um, She and I met, she was at Boston College, but she was from Indiana. And she said to me, I'm homesick. I said, where's home? She said, Indiana. I said, where's Indiana? (laughs) And 24 decided to just pack everything we own. I'm 24 years old and moved to a place where I knew no one and literally knew almost nothing about it. Why would you do that? (laughs) Because I didn't have much that was keeping me in Massachusetts. I had really good friends, but I was kind of typecast as the goofball. Gotcha. I, I was the guy who was always, you know, getting in a little bit of trouble. He was always, you know, kind of a useful idiot, but still an idiot. And at the time, you know, Massachusetts has the highest concentration of college graduates, I think, anywhere in the country at the time. You know, the guy who replaced me at Massport had a master's degree from Harvard. So I'm like... Wow is this really where I'm going to be able to make my mark? So I was like, you know what? I can move to Indiana. I can completely reboot. I can be a different person. Mm. And I think if I had known, if I had really thought about it, I don't know that I would have done it. But there were two things that motivated me. One was, it was it was one of the first times in my life at that point when I said, I'm going to do something that's risky because I was so mm-hmm. high anxiety that I just didn't take any chances. I used to look at people who traveled the world and I would be, that's for other people. Yeah. I don't think I'm ever going to do that. Um, And it was, okay, I'm in a position where I can do this. And I had a safety net. Um, my, My son's mom is a great person in that she is someone who is an anxiety reducer. And I was like, okay, I've got her as a safety net. Um, In addition, I, I think that I was I was doing it more for her than for myself mm. because of the people pleasing thing, but it turned out to be a if if it if I did it for the wrong reasons it turned out to be a great decision. Sometimes it works out that way, yeah. and you gotta love it because sure. it doesn't always. Yeah. So you get to Indiana, and I totally understand what you're saying about a chance to kind of reboot yourself because. Yeah. 
it's really hard to shake who you were if there's all these people yeah. who kind of keep you in that box. Yeah. So you go to Indiana, then does it work out the way you thought it was going to work out or, or what happens? Well, I don't know that I had a plan, <laughs> quite honestly. Well, good. Low expectations, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's a weird, there's this weird dichotomy where I am probably one of the more anxious people you'll ever meet. But I also, at the end of the day, I, I kind of have a levity where it's like, you know what, it'll all be fine. Yeah. We'll figure it out. Um, and, and I want to go back to something with Massachusetts is that it wasn't the people around me. I, I now believe that I have always had really supportive people in my life, my friends and my siblings. But it was the way that I felt about myself in front of them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, you know, when I moved to Indiana, all of that's gone. Because literally, I, I can't impress upon people enough how few people I knew here. I really knew the woman I was moving to Indiana with and a couple of her relatives who I had met maybe once. So I came here. It's completely blank slate. And one of the things I dealt with for the first and still only time, knock on wood, was a little bit of unemployment. Because I came here like, I have a bachelor's degree. I have a great Ready future. Ready to take on the world. And then what I realized, it was like, oh, Northeast Indiana isn't hankering for English majors. <laughs> yeah. So it took me a few months to find a job. And I, I found a job that was, again, just a job. But they had tuition reimbursement. And I was like, okay, I'm not really challenged at work. It's just a job. At the time, didn't have kids. So I was like... I got have a lot of discretionary time. The internet wasn't something I had access to at that time, mm. thank God, because that would have sent me off the rails. But I was like, I have a lot of spare time. They're going to pay for me to get a degree. It felt really good when I did well in school as an English major. Let's double down on that. Let's get a master's degree in English. Still have no idea what I'm going to do with it. I mean, I had a vague sense, well, maybe I'll teach college or yeah. maybe I'll be a journalist. It was the next I'll... step. Yeah, it was just a way to get another credential that I thought would move me forward, but I didn't know where I was moving forward to, mm -hmm. right? So I do that. I get a master's at then IPFW, master's in English. And <laughs> the the employer paid for the whole thing. And my gratitude for that was, thanks, I'm going to go leave and get another job. They've <laughs> since changed the policy. I bet. Yeah. But that's when my career trajectory changed because the f this was when I got my first job in marketing. Mm. Um, Parkview, a woman named Karen Manis, who was my first boss at Parkview, took a chance on me. She basically said, hey, you have you did well as a, as a graduate student. You had, your grades were good, so that tells me you work hard. It tells me you know how to learn. There's a lot of stuff we need you to do that you don't know how to do, but we're going to give you some training. I, I think it was my first or second day on the job, I went to a PageMaker 6.5 training class to learn how to be yeah. a designer. Um, so, and it was a great job in a number of different respects because I was, not only was I writing some, something I knew how to do, but I was pushed way out of my comfort zone. I was designing, I was doing photography, which turns out I'm terrible <laughs> at. It was, I was doing media relations. I was basically doing all this stuff under the marketing umbrella. And it taught me, okay, what am I good at? What am I not that good at, but how can I understand it so that I can align myself with people who can cover my gaps and skill sets? So that's that's interesting because up to this point, I think it's a surprise turn that you end up in marketing because everything you've done up to this point doesn't necessarily directly to that. Yeah. I mean, how do you end up in that position? How do you end up yeah. in front of this person at Parkview to get this job? Because I think that a lot of people would be hesitant to even try and step into anything that is outside of yeah. something they have knowledge about. So I guess, number one, how do you end up in that situation? And then two, how do you feel when they give you the job and you're there and you're like, I don't know how to do any of this shit? Yeah, well, it was it was first process of elimination. It was saying, OK, if I'm if I'm a, if I'm a writer, if that's what I do, my career paths are, are either to teach at the college level, which I had no interest in doing full time. Mm -hmm to be a journalist, to be a freelance writer. The, the freelance writer thing I had done a little bit of, and I said, I make like $100 every month. That's probably not sustainable. Yeah. So I can't do that. I don't want to teach full time. Um, the journalist thing, I actually had an interview with the Journal Gazette at one point, and I didn't get it. And it's another stroke of luck because of how print media has gone. Mm -hmm. um, but I did a little freelance writing and decided, you know, there's got to be something else. And what I love to do, I found out what I love to do is I love stories. I love learning about people and what made them tick. 
and I liked solving problems. And marketing was that. It was, okay, we're going to tell the story of this organization and help people find this solution to, in this case, healthcare problems, right? And that was it. And that's still, I tell people today, I only have three skills. I'm terrible at almost everything. I'm pretty good at writing. I'm pretty good at telling stories. I can stand up in front of a group of people and do public speaking service serviceably well, and I'm a good problem solver. Yeah. Other than that, I'm useless. But I figured out at that point, oh, the world really needs people who can help organizations tell their stories and who can solve communication problems. Yeah, and I think that that's a really important thing because there's so many people that are trained, like, for example, you're an accountant. Mm -hmm. What are your options? Anything related to yeah. accounting, yeah. right? And that is so specific because now more than ever, you go into college year one, by the time you're four, you're out. There are careers that didn't exist before. Yeah. Yeah. The rate of technology, the rate at which yeah. things are changing is so quick. So, you know, my story is similar when I was at Darlington, at that point, I was a graphic designer. Mm -hmm. And they're like, hey, we have a few things for you to do. What do you want to call this new position? Marketing director. Yeah. But I didn't know how to do that. But yeah. that was my incentive to learn. Yeah. And I, I screwed up a lot of stuff before I learned it. But what that was helpful for me is learning, yeah. I'm not a graphic designer. Mm -hmm. I'm a problem yeah. solver. I'm a builder. Exactly. Yeah. All of those little skill sets are so much more... I'm flexible, right? Yeah. Because I can problem solve this way, this way, and this way versus, well, I'm a graphic designer. I can only do things within that medium. You and yeah. I would not be sitting here doing this yeah. if I told yeah. myself I was a graphic designer. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, I tell people all the time that I used to define myself as a writer and I don't anymore. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things that I do, but it's all about telling stories helping people and solving yeah. problems. That's it. And, and if I were doing anything where I got to do those three things, I'd be happy. I mean, you know, you were on the podcast that Asher started over a year ago. The reason I love that is it's just hearing people's stories, right? You know, the marketing that I do, and I don't even really refer to myself as a marketer anymore. Mm -hmm. It's all about communication. Mm -hmm. It's all the different communication tools that help people and organizations tell their story. And let's be honest, if an organization's telling its story, it's a story about people. Yeah. So that's really what drove me. But, you know, Parkview was the first place I ever had the chance to do that. And I was almost 30 years old when mm. I figured out, oh, this is the path I think that is right for me. So, you know, I, I worked there, I ended up working at Parkview for five years. And when I started there, I was working for a small community hospital. It was a really small team. We all got along, got along really well. And as I progressed, it got way more corporate, back mm -hmm. to the Anthony doesn't like anyone telling him what to do. Mm -hmm. So I was like, nah, I don't like this anymore. Um, so I'm going to do something else. And around the same time, I decided I had what I call a two-year temper tantrum. So I had gotten master's in English, and I was like, oh, I have, again, I have a master's degree. The world's going to hand me, you know, my future, and that didn't happen. And what I saw is people who had an MBA starting to progress into management positions. And I thought MBAs were bullshit, but I was like, well, if he can do it, so can I. And I had a boss that had an MBA that I didn't think very highly of, but I was like, well, if he can do it, I'm going to go back and get an MBA. And I did. And then I made a career, I made a job change. I went to work for Barnes & Thornburg. One of the people I worked with was Don Roseman. Love so Don. A, lo, Don is awesome. Awesome people, but I found out really quickly it just wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. It was... You know, one, one of the things that came back to bear was that ADHD. And I, and I remember on day two, I was like, oh, this is always going to be about lawyers. Mm. I don't know that I'm that interested. Who would have thought? I know. I know. Um, and don't get me wrong, great people, some of yeah. whom are still friends to this day. But I was like, I don't have the attention span to do this. And that's when I went to Asher. And at Asher, I was like, oh, I'm going to work on 10 different clients in 10 different industries pretty much every day. Mm -hmm. So I get this wide variety of stuff to work on, and I'm going to do other stuff in parallel with that that's going to give me this variety and this complexity that I like in my work life. Yeah. Um, so it all came together at Asher, but it was trial and error, trial and error, and a lot of happy accidents. Well, you know, it's one of those things, wrong reasons, right results. Exactly. Right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like the fact you got an MBA out of spite and it yeah. ended up working yeah. out for you. Yeah. But <laughs> I think that 
a lot of a major help for you was you didn't have a set path. No. When when people expect this thing to be achieved, they say anything that is not this, I'm not going to do. It's all leading to that. Yeah. But you kind of doing this, 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 that. I mean, that job at Parkview was that first taste of you're good at learning. Mm -hmm. You can solve problems and you can figure it out. Right. You go back to something like Barnes and Thornburg and you realize wrong direction. Yeah. So through that process of elimination, you start to get warmer into just who am I as a person? And I mean, again, another reason why we're so similar is because I have clients too. They are a full range of different things. So it's always exciting. You're always learning and you just taking note of who I am, what opportunities are not good for me. All that experimentation was so critical, but you didn't have a plan, which is so beneficial versus if you would have said, I'm going to be an accountant, even though it wasn't yeah. something that worked out for you. Well, one of the things that I, I tell, you know, I, I work with a lot of college students and I'll tell them, I said, don't have a five-year plan, have five-year goals. Mm. You know, imagine if you had had a five-year plan that you put together in February of 2020. What's that going to look like in March of 2020? It's probably yeah. not going to look pretty good when the world gets, you know, you know, turned on its axis. But have goals. Goals are, you know, something you can count on. You can change them, but... You want to work towards – my goal was always to be as independent as I could be. Um, And I really didn't get that and still still don't have as much as I would like, but have a lot of it. Some of that's just finding the right employer. I mean, Asher is such a good match for me um, because they they put up with a lot in me that I don't think other employers would. But it's hopefully a mutually beneficial relationship. But it took me – you know, I didn't start working there until I was almost 35. It took me that long to find a place where I felt like, oh, I fit in here. Um, you know, I had always, as a kid, sort of this inner world that I had. I always looked at adults going to work when I was a kid, and I was like, I don't know how they do that. That looks terrible. And then when I started working, I was like, oh, I was right. This yeah. is kind of, this kind yeah. of sucks. And then when I got to Asher, there was just there was a seriousness about the work, but an informality where people weren't really allowed to take themselves too seriously. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I like that. I like that all of these people know I'm a goofball, but they know how to leverage that in a positive way. And I think, I mean, at that point, you're introducing culture and the importance of culture, right? Yeah. You can work at an agency and have them run totally different, right? You can work in the same job doing the same thing across a different – and it just depends on who that culture is. And most of the times, it's some college dropout or someone else who just got it right who says – I don't know how everyone else does it, but here's what we're going to do it. And I think so many people have an experience of this is a bad culture, but they don't say there's probably a better culture out there. Let me go. They're just this is work. Right. Because when they were kids, they saw mom and dad. And something that I always heard growing up was like, you're not supposed to enjoy work. And it's kind of like, yeah, okay, But, you know, being able to push past that and realizing, oh, there's lots of different ways to work, to make money, to run a company. It's its a breath of fresh air. Yeah. So, I mean, you must have felt great once you I, learned I did. It. And it's, you know, it's just, it's such a different, a, a different equation to have a job that, you know, I, I, I have bad days. I have, sometimes I have two bad days in a row, but I don't have three in a row very often. Mm. You know, I do a lot of leadership training and I tell people all the time, it's, it's simple advice, but if you hate your job, leave, go get another one. I mean, yeah. it's really simple. You shouldn't hate your job. Um, you know, I had to learn that. I, I don't want to just want to say I ever hated my job, but you should do something you love. And it's not about, you and I have talked about this too. I think some of the worst advice, and I'm stealing this from someone else, but I think some of the worst advice we give young people is follow your passion. No, figure out what you're good at and something the world needs, that intersection. Mm-hmm. Then keep working at it because where your passion is going to come from is when you get the positive reinforcement yeah. that comes with being really great at what you do. But the other side of that is don't do something that you hate just because you're good at it, mm-hmm. right? Find something you're good at where the results or the people you surround. I mean, that's one of the things that I've been super fortunate is working with great people who motivate me. It's like the sneaky part is I want to solve problems the, the, the part I say is I want to solve problems. The sneaky part of that is I want to help people, and I want to help good people. I kind of have a personal no-assholes policy where if someone's a jerk, I'm just not going to work with them. Yeah. And, you know, I've gotten a little more latitude to actually deploy that <laughs> as I've gotten older. Yeah. But I will – if you're good to me, I will 
jump on a grenade for you. Yeah. And that's what motivates me. But it's surrounding myself with the right people. Yeah, there's so many points to that because I, I, I totally agree. And it's one of those things as I learned when I got older, like, yeah, I have – a policy in my contract, I can fire any one of my clients. Mm -hmm. It took me a while, but I'm like, no, yeah. I need to be able to fire them as much as they can Pretty fire me. Pretty liberating the first time you do it. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, yeah. It's, it's phenomenal. I've also gotten better at picking the right clients. There's a lot of, I call it like the first date, where mm -hmm. like, I'm just trying to figure out if this is going to work out. Yeah. But um, I, I just, I love that because I think the biggest thing that entrepreneurship taught me and working directly for entrepreneurs when I wasn't one full time was the fact that I learned so much about myself, mm -hmm. right? I learned what I was good at, yeah. what I wasn't good at. I swear by Clifton Strengths because that was the first time I was able to put into words what I loved and what I was naturally good at, right? So like my number one is positivity. Mm -hmm. My number two is connectedness. Mm -hmm. And it just makes so much more sense because I learned to move around in the world in the way that was most innately on point with who I am. Mm -hmm. And I've said this to this date, I have received more money in contracts and scholars and all whatever through a drink and a great conversation yeah. than yeah. I ever did with a PowerPoint showing sure. you the PowerPoint yeah. and the plan has to come after. Yeah. But I have gotten so many connections off being, you know, the woo connectedness person yeah. that I am. Yeah. I couldn't do it if I was doing it the other way. Yeah. And that other person probably couldn't do it the way I did. So me just understanding who I am and how I operate Again, the goal is the same. Yeah. The path that I take is better. And when you give yourself that permission, yeah. just everything becomes so much simpler. Yeah, well, and anything good that's ever happened to me professionally is the direct result of a relationship. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's someone, you know, it's Karen Manis giving me a shot at Parkview. It's Bruce Gilman saying, hey, you're a good writer. Yeah. It's someone like John Dorch at Parkview saying, hey, I'm going to put you on this committee because I think you can help. And me go, and I, I'm not so sure I can, but I'll try it, right? Because I want to help you. Yeah. So it's it's people doing that. And now, you know, I'm, I'm kind of moving into the part of my career, especially at Asher, where I'm more interested in legacy than what I'm doing today. Mm -hmm. And I want to be that for other people. I want to help yeah. people understand that sometimes their only ceiling is they think they have a ceiling. Yeah, and I mean, I can attest to that because – the fact that we're similar is so good. And the fact that you and I ride bikes, we sit down, we do all mm -hmm. sorts of stuff. But yeah. it's, I ask you a lot of those questions of like, look, I'm here in my life right yeah. now. What do I do next? Because yeah. for me, it's one of those, I don't have a blueprint for what I'm doing because I went off the rails, yeah. right? I'm yeah. making my own path. So yeah. there's not, oh, well, you get a promotion. It's like, yeah. no, I have all these things. What do I do with it? Yeah. Right. And, and it can be a little bit scary, yeah. but- like you having an Anthony Giuliano or a John Dorch or all these people, yeah. it's such a guiding light. Yeah, well, here's here's maybe the most important thing that I've figured out in my career. It's that you don't have to be the smartest person about your topic mm. to be a great speaker, to, create, to be a great teacher, to be a great practitioner. There's always going to be someone who's smarter than you. You just have to bring a perspective, a unique perspective, to be honest about it and say, yeah. here's how I see it. You need to bring a, a decent drive to get it done well. Not right, because today's thousand right answers, but to do it well. And you have to be someone who is enjoyable to work with. There's always going to be someone smarter. You know, and it, that was the biggest revelation for me as a speaker. And it's changed the way that I speak because I used to, I have huge imposter syndrome and will for the rest of my life. But I've come to realize that if you have imposter syndrome, that's just a sign that you're a decent human being. You have mm. some humility and you yeah. have you have a, a, enough sense to say, you know what, I'm okay, but I, uh, I better watch it. I better keep working. So when I, now when I speak, I'm like, oh, the, this group can get this information from other people or other sources. Yeah. I got to bring stories to the yeah. table. I have to bring experience to the table. And I can't bring all the answers or try to. I have to give them information, whether it's teaching a class, doing leadership training, doing LinkedIn training. My goal is I'm going to give you all the answers to every question you could ask. Yeah. It's you're going to leave here equipped to ask better questions. Yeah. And, you know, there's so much value in your delivery style, mm -hmm. right? How I give you information is valuable to those people who receive information that way. You know, um, you have me come in and, and help you teach some of your classes, yeah. which it was that first thing. It was like, the hell do I know about teaching and all this? But and meanwhile, I'm saying, oh shit, I'm letting Aaron do this, and now they're gonna like him more than me. <laughs> right. So we're <laughs> I'm both be useless. Yeah. We're both dealing with the same thing. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. you know, one of the things that that helps me learn, and any other education thing I've done is 
if I can make you laugh and realize, look, guys, this isn't the most yeah. interesting stuff, but here's how it's beneficial. You get so much of a rise out of it to where it's like, I feel great knowing yeah. that I delivered content in a way that is relevant to me and to my audience. And that's why I think I told you, it's like, yeah. who's in this class? Like, yeah. what kind of yeah. whatever are they? And it's just so incredible that the value that we have as presenters, as whatever, is just how warm we are, how enthusiastic yeah. we are, that little thing yeah. we say. Well, and it's it's another through line from when I was a kid because how I used to deflect all the negativity was through humor. Mm. I, I was I was usually I have a friend who used to say that, you know, I would say ten things and only one of them would be funny, but it was the funniest thing he heard all day. Yeah. He had to tolerate the other nine to get yeah. to that one thing. But I was always writing jokes in my head and and not, you know, more like looking at the world, and I still do, looking at the world a little turned. Like I see things differently, I think, than a lot of people do, and I bring that to my perspective. But as a kid, that's how I deflected stuff. Yeah. That was my defense mechanism. And today one of the things that I just absolutely hate is the idea of people spending time in boring presentations. Uh, so I try to be the opposite of that, is to bring a little fun and a little energy to it. And some of it is kind of like stand-up comedy cloaked as corporate training. <laughs> right. Yeah. You, just, yeah. you, you balance yeah. that it line. It can't be all that because, you know, you have to bring some seriousness to it. Yeah. But if you can bring some of that in, then that's what people remember. Well, and one of the things I, I've, I've been fortunate enough to hear you speak in a variety of things where, like, sometimes I don't even know you're speaking. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, hey, you know. <laughs> but it's it, what I love about you, and it's because of this is how I want to be, is, is this no bullshit thing. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be here and pretend. Yeah. If Anthony's presenting, he's going to keep it real. He's going to mm -hmm. be honest and he's going to speak to the human and everyone. And yeah. when you do that in a room, you can just sense the difference of everyone like yeah. taking a breath because we're all just being human here. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, it's really the the thing that is, you know, a, a moment that I really, really respect is when I look back at how my story started. And to be standing in front of a room full of people, there's times when I'm standing in front of a room full of people and I just laugh to myself. I'm like, yeah. if some of my early college professors knew that I was doing this, mm -hmm. they would either die immediately or roll over in their grave because yeah. I was the last person you'd ever expect to be sharing anything with a group of people. Mm -hmm. So I kind of try to honor that as much as I can mm -hmm. um, and say, how do I make it uniquely interesting to this unique group of individuals? I, I don't always hit that mark, but I try. So at this point, you've kind of found your groove. <laughs> yeah. You're at Asher. You got a little off track, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you, you went all over with your career and you figured it out. Where does... Point six four come? Where does you yeah. becoming an entrepreneur fit into all this? So I start at Asher and um, I, I I do pretty well there. I find my place. I'm surrounded by really great people. I have really great clients. One of the things that happens as a sideline is I start teaching. You know, one of the most important organizational relationships I've had in my life is with Indiana Tech. Mm. My two-year temper tantrum when I went and got an MBA um, I ended up going to Indiana Tech because I had my son, who's now 22, was, I think, you know, when I started three or four years old, I had a, a fairly serious job. And I was like, eh, I want to do this, but I've got home and I've got work. How am I going to do it? And Indiana Tech made it possible. And the great thing was I was back to being surrounded by adult students. I was like, oh, this is where I do really yeah. well. And I had some great instructors along the way, ended up finishing the MBA. And while, and I, and, you know, everyone says that what makes us different is our people, but I really, Indiana Tech, just the people there, have, I've had lifelong relationships with a variety, of, well, I shouldn't say lifelong, but the last, you know, 15 or so years. Um, I, somebody said, hey, you have a master's in English, we need people who can teach writing classes, can you do that here? And I was like, I don't know, I've never taught before. But I started teaching writing classes. Again, somebody, Susan McGrade, who's still a, a professor at Indiana Tech, I met with her and she convinced me I could do it. Again, seeing something in me that I didn't see in myself. And I started teaching. And I was like, you know, I love this. This is what I love to do. I don't want to do it full time, but I love it enough that I want to keep doing it. That became something that I did in a number of different ways. Then I sparked up a relationship with then IPFW, teaching through the Division of Continuing Studies, which is the Social Media Professional Certificate class that mm -hmm. I still teach and that you contribute to. And that 
manifested itself in people saying, hey, you're pretty good in that environment. Can you speak at our event? Can you train our team how to do this? And it really didn't fit in the Azure box. And here's the the big, you know, again, the big news is just really fortunate to have an employer that was like, yeah, if that lights you on fire, go do it. Make sure you take care of your clients. Yeah. Make sure you're not too absent that, you know, you're you're not tending to what your coworkers need. But if you want to have two careers, go do it. So I started Point Six Four as a way to kind of package that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's all inbound. I really don't sell yeah. Point Six Four other than talking about the work that I do. And it really all works together. You know, at Asher, I'm do I'm executing along with our team strategies that help me understand what really works and what doesn't. I'm teaching people theoretically, here is how you do this stuff, but bringing the experience of working at Asher to the table and, you know, telling stories and using examples that are real world along the way. It's the best, it's the best thing ever because it all, the teaching informs the work, the work informs the teaching. And, you know, what, what I think Asher realized is that I would probably have left. I've been there for 17 years now. I probably would have left if they said, you have to stop doing the other stuff and just focus on Asher. I think I would have, I would be gone yeah. only because I need that variety. And Asher has been good enough to say, yeah, you know, we, we'd like you focused on just us, but go do it if that makes you happy. Well, and it goes to show that a company really can accommodate different types of people yeah. if they really wanted to, right? Yeah. So many people, we go back to just, Nope, here's how we do things, figure it out, right? If you don't fit, we'll find someone else versus saying, how do we find people that are good at what they do, will do good work here, but how do we also invest in making sure that we're giving them what they need? You know, I I do freelance work for for Asher as well, and it's been such a wonderful experience because everyone I work there with is super good, super communicative, and I've worked with past agencies that weren't like that at all. And it's not a matter of can you, it's a matter of like, where are your priorities? Yeah. Where is your culture? Yeah. And, you know, the, the other thing, too, is it, it doesn't hurt Asher if I'm up in front of a group of 50 leadership Fort Wayne, right. <laughs> you know, students sure. sharing, hey, here's something I know, because it's relationship building. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that's what I've found from a business development standpoint. The best business development strategy is to share what you know, to stand right. in front of people or, write, you know, I write a column. I've written a column for more than 10 years for Business Weekly. Here's every month, here's something that I know or that my coworkers have taught me. Um, the podcast is helping people talk about, you know, their stories. And I think I'm wired for that. And Asher was like, yeah, that helps us too when you're out there and you're meeting people. So I think it's really the symbiotic relationship where I get to do all the things that, that really I believe that I'm put on the earth to do. And part of that, a big part of that is what I do for Asher. And it all just works. Mm-hmm. And I just... I think the biggest value that I get from just your story is the fact you built what was working for you. Like Mm -hmm. instead of taking an ADHD kid and trying to put him in a box he didn't fit, you built a box around you that satisfied you, keeps you from being in a situation that you feel is too stale. You learn, you grow, you change, and everybody wins from it. So I think that for so many years, especially – you know, back in the 70s, 80s, when you were trying to figure things out, it's this thing where we don't give enough energy to the fact that we are all different yeah. and our career needs to reflect that. Our relationships need to reflect that. Everything in our life, you know, there's a natural way that we do things. And yeah. when we focus too much on trying to fit somewhere we don't fit, yeah. we end up miserable. We end up not doing the work we need to. But then seeing you where it's like a lot of people couldn't manage what you manage. Well, and a lot of it is realizing that your best qualities are also your worst qualities. Mm-hmm. You know, when I talked about I was really paralyzed by anxiety as a kid, it prevented me from, you know, I've since I've gone to Australia, I've gone to you know places that I never would have thought I went as a kid. Um because I, I could have gotten stuck with just the anxiety, but I said, oh, the flip side of that is hypervigilance. I'm a guy who's going to deliver. If I take on a project, I'm going to do it and I'm going to do yeah. it well. You know, the the chip on my shoulder that I still have and, and, you know, being someone who doesn't do great with authority, that is something that makes me a champion of the underdog and wants to help people who are fighting, you know, that that authority figure. So in, in a lot of different ways. So it's it's knowing yourself well enough, being honest with yourself about where you really aren't going to do well. Um, you know, I, I, I wake up every day and I said, I, 
I'm basically unemployable if I'm not doing what I'm doing right now. Yeah. I don't know that another full-time employer would put up with my crap. Um, and I really need this sideline. The, the, the challenge, of course, is you alluded to it, is there's a lot going on. And it's just harnessing it in a way that I'm a big productivity geek, huge productivity geek. Because I have to have systems in place to make it all work or it would all go off the rails. So that's interesting, right? Because I look at you, I look at everything you're doing, and then you tell me you're ADHD. I'm saying this guy's dropping all the balls, but you're not. (laughs) So when did you start to learn how to manage all of these things? (laughs) When I started dropping balls. When I I realized, oh, I can't just keep it in my head. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm not a big business books person. I think 99% of them are bullshit. But one exception to that is Getting Things Done by David Allen, which is all about productivity. I was like, oh, your head is for having ideas, not holding them. Great advice. Write things down, Anthony. Have a system where if you're going to do something. You know, I'm the type of person where if I'm leaving in the morning and my girlfriend says to me, hey, can you pick up a loaf of bread on the way home? And I try to keep that in my head. It's just not going to happen. I think that's true for most people. But for me, there's no chance. So I have to put on my calendar 515 pick up bread. I do that and I'm great. So people look at my calendar and they're like, you're so busy. I'm like, no, I'm no more busy than you. I just write it down because I have to. Um, And that's what really was trial and error, right? It was realizing as a student, oh, I don't know how to read. I'm looking at pages. So I get a focus and I have to correct myself when I realize, oh, I just passed by two paragraphs, but I was thinking about the 1979 California Angels. I got to go back and read those two paragraphs again. I have to, if it's important, I need to read it two or three times to to understand it. And that's, you know, and I'm an English major, so I did a (laughs) lot of reading twice. But it was really being honest about here are my deficiencies, and I got to come up with a system that's going to cover for those, or I'm going to be lying to myself and everybody else. Well, the fact that it's an ever-evolving system, right? I mean, we've talked a lot about how it's like it started off here, then it's here, and now we're trying this. And it's that same thing with me where it's like I'm trying to figure out how I work best because at this point right now, I'm running three businesses. Each one of those businesses has a variety of clients. Each one of those clients Mm -hmm. may have a few projects going on, which each have a a, a number of tasks. And then at that point, I have contractors that are doing work for me. Plus, I have to, you know, make sure I'm getting the cat food before I go home and all of that. Plus you own property, plus you do all these other things. You probably have more going on than I do. (laughs) Keeping it up here is the wildest thing. Mm -hmm. So it's like those systems, as much as they seem like a lot and overkill for everyone else, it helps me take it from here, put it where it goes. And I know every morning or every night before, I'm like, where do I have to be tomorrow? And I literally can't tell you where I'm going to be until I look at it the night before. Yeah. Cool. There's, There's a quote that I heard. I forget who said it, but it's frameworks foster freedom. Mm -hmm. What that means is, you know, people might look at the way I run my professional life and say, oh, that's really restrictive. And I'm like, no, because I've got it handled, I can have all this other possibilities for, I'm going to go do that. I can't always do it, but I can at least have the freedom to think about all these other creative ideas because I'm not continually having to go through all the churn of the self-loathing of, I forgot all this stuff. Right. So if I, if I invest time, I mean, one of the things I've been training people on a lot recently is the act of slowing down in the short run in order to speed up in the long run. And a lot of that is a lesson for me, right? Yeah. To say, if I take an hour at the end of the week and I look at absolutely every project that I've committed to, and I can say, what's the next action that can move that forward? That hour pays off tenfold mm-hmm. the next week when I can actually execute. Because yeah. if I was trying to keep it in my brain, none of it would happen and I'd probably be doing things to, you know, to make me feel better about not doing all that stuff. Right. And it's it's very similar. There's this adage where we talk about creatives, right? I'm a graphic designer. There's a lot of creatives in the world that think, yeah, creatives wake up when they want. They create when they want. They, The most successful creators build a sandbox. Mm-hmm. From this time to this time, I'm creating. From mm-hmm. this time, from that structure yeah. helps you live in that moment because for me, if my day isn't planned out, if I don't know what I'm doing this week, what has to get done, yeah. What am I missing? What am I not doing? What should I be working? There's so much doubt. I'm doing thing A. I'm thinking about thing B, C, D, E, and F and vice versa. But when I say, I know what I have to do this week. I know the day I'm going to do it. Then for the next two hours, I do that thing guilt-free, whether that's being with my girlfriend, whether it's being with family, whether that's having fun Mm -hmm. or whether that's working. So that structure 
is so necessary. And because I'm not good at it, that's mm-hmm. why I've learned to be good at it exactly. through the discipline, not exactly. because I'm innately good at it. Exactly. I, I have to cover my deficiencies with tools and with systems. Yeah. Um, and those enable me to to contribute. If yeah. not, I wouldn't be able to contribute much. Well, and even more so when you're a business owner, because if mm-hmm. you're looking at just a, a normal yeah. job, you show up, you do what you got to do, and you leave. And one of the things that I always tell people is that external motivator of you getting fired or getting in trouble mm-hmm. is so good for you oh, showing yeah. up at eight every day. Yeah. When you're running your own business, yeah. you have to decide when sure. you show up. Sure. And I learned early on that's like, all right, man, you're dropping balls. I I would have clients that would say, hey, is that project done? Totally forgot. Yeah. I would yeah. forget entire projects yeah. when I was 17. Yeah. Well, the other thing too, so so yeah, systems are part of it. Tools are part of it. Knowing yourself is part of it. But surrounding yourself with the right kind of people. I mean, mm-hmm. I am super fortunate that I have found a team both at Asher and you're part of it, um, you know, with 0.64 that do stuff I'm not good at. Yeah. Um, you know, that who... I depend upon, you know, if I'm, if I'm, if I have a project for Asher and I've got a, you know, a lunch presentation, there's an hour where I'm not going to be able to answer emails. So if mm-hmm. something, you know, blows up mm-hmm. and, I, and they've got it, you know, it's, it's, it's humbling to say, oh, they'd be fine. <laughs> yeah. You know, Asher would be fine if I went away. I think I still am additive to it with what mm-hmm. I bring to the table, but they have my back every day, which enables me to get out in front of these audiences and meet people, which hopefully brings some work in the door that enables them to do what they do. Yeah. But I couldn't do what I do without the people who I work with. I just couldn't. Yeah, and, and that's super important. So another interesting thing with Point Six Four, you're running that business, you have Asher. There are so many people that are so desperate to leave whatever job and do the yeah. entrepreneur thing full time. I'm jumping in and it's almost glorified as this kind of like brave, like I'm all in attitude. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I always say failure is super real, right? For me, when I was young, I didn't have kids. I, I didn't have expenses. Mm-hmm. I could live with mom for a while and it yep. was fine. But, you know, there are people that if they fail, mm-hmm. their mortgage doesn't get paid. They have kids. They have other expenses. Yeah. So, I mean, why haven't you gone full time? Why do you have a job even though you have this company? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what would you tell someone who isn't sure what to do next? Yeah. So um, great question. I mean, the the first answer, the reason I've been able to do it is because I have an employer that lets me do it. So I'm super fortunate Mm -hmm. there. Um, Part of it is I have a lot of energy and I, I don't want to do. I don't know, understand how people spend time on bullshit. I don't, I watch like zero TV. I apologies to those who play a lot of video games. I don't, I've never been interested in it. Um, I don't, people talk, I've never seen a single episode of Breaking Bad. I don't, I don't know anything about it. So I don't, my, what I love to do is work and solve problems and spend yeah. time with, I mean, I, I really put my time in, in a few buckets. There's health, which I need to do better at, but spending time moving and you know sweating a little bit, spending time with the people I care about and trying to be more intentional about that time, not also being focused on something else, work and sleep. And that's really it. And it's not, oh, all he does is work. I'm like, I love what I do. I'd yeah. rather talk, I'd rather talk to someone. I would, I mean, I tell people this all the time. If we're having a good conversation, I, I say I'd rather watch a movie about this conversation than Star Wars. I don't understand Star Wars. I don't. I'm sorry, Star Wars fans. But I just, I've never been someone, th- there's Scott Galloway wrote a book called The Algebra of Happiness, which is another businessy book that is not bullshit. Um, and he talks about, you know, you want to sweat more than watching other people sweat. It's mm-hmm. like, yeah, that's that's right. I I don't want to be leaning back, consuming a social media news feed. I don't want to be leaning back, consuming, binge watching to me makes me want to throw up. Yeah. It's just the idea of it just makes me want to throw up because I'm like, there's so, I don't know how people can be bored. I'm like, there's so much abundance in the world. So this is a long winded way of answering your question, but part of it is saying, Hey, I'm going to double down on the fact that I love what I do. And I would rather be working on a marketing plan for someone than watching TV. Mm -hmm. You got to get some downtime, but I try to get my downtime. Let's take a walk with my girlfriend. Let's, you know, you know, have fun with a friend, with a friend and just, you know, go do something that we're going to connect. 
Um, but I, I don't have time for crap. I don't, or I try not to. Um, so some of it is that. Honestly, some of it is fear, fear of failure. Some of the reason why I haven't gone all in on 0.64 is I would have to pay for my own health insurance. Mm-hmm. So it's the anxiety kicking in and saying, I don't know that this would work. But also being super fortunate that I have the best of both worlds. I can work for a company that I really love and work with people who are super smart and have my place there where I can contribute. And then when I can go do it on my own, I go do it on my own yeah. and try to make those things you know, work together. Yeah. And it's worked. I mean, it's worked pretty well, at least from my perspective. And you know, that balance is important because I went into entrepreneurship full time once I was laid off. And for me, the thing in my head was like, I'm never going to let someone else determine my success or failure to this level again. Yeah. I have had yeah. mostly good situations with work, but that one, one was like two weeks, ain't shit. Mm-hmm. I yeah. had to move back in with mom. I yeah. had like just mm-hmm. all of these things that yeah. someone made a decision that affected my life in such a dramatic way. So that was like my must have, but I struggled for a long, long time and I didn't necessarily quit, but I probably could have looked harder yeah. to be able to sure. say, sure. because one of the things I said is I got comfortable when I had that job yeah. and I stopped looking for clients. So when I got laid off, I'm like, I'm 10 years in the game. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. I have, yeah. but it didn't. Well, I have a lot of adma- admiration for people who do take the risk and do it. Um, but, but people who are looking at starting a business have to understand that everybody has their own story. There, yeah. there are some people who are just brave enough to take the leap with no safety net, but there's a lot of people who look like they're taking a leap with no safety net and they have one. Right. They just don't, you know, they don't promote and, it. And that's what we don't talk about, about, right? That's right. You say, oh, this person yeah. did yeah. it, but you don't realize they had yeah. X, X, Y, and Z. And, you know, yeah. for me, whenever I talk to people, it's kind of like, you have to realize what you actually want not what mold you're trying to fit into. Because I always say entrepreneurship is sexier now than it's ever been, right? It's cool. Mm -hmm. We all see the Ty Lopez ads and all that. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those things where it's like, you have to figure out what's right for you. You have to, I mean, you're super happy and you're not doing it full time. You found a a mix that works for you. You know, I've always said that, um, you know, my, I, I don't have, I, I, there's not a date at which I'm planning to leave Asher. I, I'm going to be there as long as yeah. it still works. But if I ever were to, or they were to say, you know, you need to find your next thing, I would probably work for myself. I would yeah. do it full time. But it wouldn't be something I would go into lightly, and I don't think people should go into it lightly. No. But I also think <laughs> if, if you have the opportunity to do it, do it. Very little in life is terminal except death. Yeah. Um, you can recover from stuff. I'm living proof. I've recovered from a lot of stuff. And, you know, I, I try to, when, when I make a stupid mistake, learn from it. And that's, I think, what life is all about. Yeah, something I tell a lot of people because now it, I'm getting a lot of people coming to me asking me for advice who are just kind of getting started, which, you know, uh, it's kind of like, why me? But um, one of the things I tell people... Well, well let, me, let me interrupt for a second. Go ahead. I know why you, because you've done it successfully, because people see some of the things you've done at a very young age. Don't diminish that. Yeah. You've done some great stuff, and other people are seeing that. So take a moment to honor that. Don't come at me with this humility bullshit. You're doing great stuff, um, and give yourself credit for it. Um, there's a lot of people... You know, you, you and I, I know your story... And you didn't have a lot of advantages as a kid. You've overcome some things that are hard to overcome. So give yourself some credit. (laughs) Yeah. And I think most of us don't. Yeah. Because whenever I interview people, one of the things they say is, I haven't thought about that in forever. Yeah. Like we go right into the next, like, what is the next thing I have to do? What is the next thing I have to achieve? And you're totally right. You know, I feel better when I spend time saying, I am qualified. Like I should be teaching classes on social media ads yeah. because I've, sure. I've done it enough yeah. times and I've failed enough times to realize yeah. that you can bounce back from a lot. But one of the best advice I, I tell people whenever they don't know what direction to go is a lot of the times it's not 
a good and a bad decision. It may be a good and a better decision. Yeah. Because some people think that if I don't make the right decision yeah. every single yeah. time, yeah. I'm going to, it's like, no, you fail through a series of very bad decisions. It's very rare that one bad decision will take you out. Yeah. It's, it goes back to something I said earlier. There's not one right answer. There's a thousand good answers. There's some really bad answers, yeah. but there's a lot of possibilities. And I, and I just, I try every day to live a little bit more on the abundance side and say, you know, that one of my mantras going into 2022 is you can have, you can't have everything, but you can have anything. And I really believe that to be true. And I'm just super fortunate that I have pretty much everything I want. Yeah. Now I have to get better at not trying to have absolutely everything I could. It's being content. You know, you, you and I talk a lot personally about that, you know, self-doubt and about that imposter syndrome. And I think it's it's a really important place to, to get where you don't overstate your abilities, but you take time to appreciate when when something good happens. You know, it's the whole it's the whole reason I named my consulting business point six four. Because it's a joke. It's funny to me that, you know, I was once that guy, the guy with the 0.64 GPA. And a lot of my story is the little celebration of every day saying, okay, I beat that guy. I I finally overcame that guy. But if I don't watch it, I'm going to be that guy again. You you got to stay on it because those those natural things just come and get you. Yeah. And um, it's that constant battle. But I mean, you feel good when you look back at all the things you achieved. And I think it's so incredible because we are capable of so many things. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the person who hasn't even tried to work out, who hasn't even tried to start a business, of course, you're not going to see the abilities that you have to be healthier or to have that huge business. I never would have thought I was doing the things I'm doing now, but it takes a step a day. Uh, I don't know if I can, but let's try it. Mm -hmm. Falling down a few times. And then when you look back, you realize you scaled half the mountain. Correct. But we spend so much time looking at what's left that we don't take a look back. It's like, look at how far you've come. You don't need to figure it out tomorrow. For sure. You just need to figure out the thing that's right in front of you right now. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So uh, one of the other things that I want to talk to you about is 0.64, Asher, teaching and health. And I'm sure there's other stuff in there somehow. What's your take on balance? What is your take on, like, how do you not go crazy doing all the stuff you're doing? Well, um, really surrounding myself with people who help me figure that out, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Knowing that I I haven't always been good about the relationship side of my life. I, I, you know, there were times when I put work first. There were times when I should have said, no to stuff and said yes. And I'm trying to get better at that. Mm -hmm. Um, Part of it is being super honest with people about that. You know, the person, my girlfriend, the person I'm in a relationship with now, I basically told her from day one, this is who I am. This is what you're getting into. I'm a bag of anxiety. Um, Here is how you can make that better. Here's how you can make it worse. And she's been great. She's like, hey, this guy isn't perfect. Neither am I. We're going to work this out. Um, it is, you know, my son is, he gets me, he's 22 years old. And I think he's like, yeah, my dad's not perfect, but we're going to leverage the good in this. It's really about who you surround yourself with. Um, you know, what I'm trying to do is to prioritize first health. And and I have a lot of work to do there. I've kind of slipped in the last year, but you know, the decision that I made is, obvious to most people, but if you don't have your health, you're not going to be much good for your work. You're not going to be much good for the people you care about. So you got to put health first. Number two has got to be people because why are you doing any of this stuff if you're not helping other people live in a way that's consistent with their goals and it that's what life is all about, right? Relationships. Works number three. Um, and it's 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 in the top three, but I I want to do a better job of making it truly third. Yeah. You know, it goes back to what I said earlier with you, you can have anything, but you can't have everything. I'm starting to say no more often to stuff, to opportunities that either get in the way of relationships or get in the way of my health. Yeah. And it's hard, you know, but some of it is delegating. You know, it was a, I don't know if I've told you this, but it was a difficult decision for me to offload some of the social media class to you. I was like, and again, that inner seven-year-old was like, oh no, what if Aaron's great 
and the class is like, why do we need you? We have him, right? And then the other side of my brain saying, okay, Aaron's just going to bring a different perspective, and he is going to be great, but that doesn't negate what you do. So knowing that there are some opportunities I need to bypass, I need to delegate, and that's going to free up time for me to be in the right headspace when I'm with the people I want to be with. Another yeah. thing is, you know, that I'm going to try to be more intentional about is to use the investment in health to connect with people. You know, mm-hmm. instead of I was a runner for a long time and I was a very antisocial runner. I'm going to run. I'm not one of these people that I'm not going to go to the color run and talk to people. I'm like, no, I'm going to put in my earbuds. I'm going to lock in and I'm going to do it. And you better not talk to me. Well, now it's like I'd rather walk for an hour with my girlfriend and talk about life, mm-hmm. kill some calories that way, then go for a run for an hour on my own. So it's combining yeah. things that hit the right values and things that are important to me. Yeah. So balance is, and you got to realize there's different seasons in your life. I mean, 100%. I got my ass kicked in November, and to some extent I still am now, by work. And it's realizing, okay, I just got to get through the next few weeks, but stop over committing to stuff. That's a lesson I think I'm going to have to learn. Because of my short attention span, I'm going to have to continue to learn it, but I hope I get a little better at it every year. Yeah, and I think there's so much good in that because most of the time when you and I hang out, we're on a bike. Yeah. And I think when we got on a bike last time, this summer, we both said, by the way, I'm not practiced this year. (laughs) Because last year was crazy. This year we're both like, all right, we'll do a few miles and we'll go get a burger. Yeah, we're going to go a little slower, yeah. (laughs) But um, another example is I remember uh, Brenda Gerber-Vincent with Greater Fort Wayne love her the first time I said, Hey, let's get together. And you know, what happens when you get together, you get a coffee, Mm -hmm. right? And we went to the zoo. Mm -hmm. She said, let's go to the zoo. We went to the zoo and we got ice cream and we walked for an hour and a half and got to know each other, talked about everything. And that's something I'm just like, that is so incredible because when you are in a position where you have to work so much, where you have to connect with people so much, how do you integrate some fun? Yeah. And it's one of those things where I'm like, I had the best day with Brenda and we like we got work done. We yeah. talked and had the meeting, but yeah. could have sat down and I could have had my third cup of coffee yeah. Yeah. or we went and yeah. did that. And that's yeah. one of those things where it's like, I feel so grateful that most of my meetings throughout the day are with interesting people. Yeah talking about interesting opportunities yep. yeah. and it no days look the same. And so I think that that's a way that I integrate fun into my, my work day. And it's yep. like, yeah, I worked, but I did it in a way that was really cool. Right. It, it works better when you're working with people you like. Yeah. And you know, the other thing is a hundred percent, the people that are around you matter because yeah. you know, like you, I've had partners, that kind of get it. I've had partners who don't, but like with Eliana now, Mm -hmm. you know, we've been dating about a year, a hundred percent they're with me and not just they're with me, but she's the reason I have a third business that we share together. Yeah, sure. And I remember when we were living still at my mom's in my mom's basement, you know, ride or die. She was right there with me. Mm -hmm. We sat in the front of the porch after going on a walk. And the question was, what are we focusing on for the next six months? Like, Mm -hmm. what do we want? And one of the conversations we had is like, we want to work, we want to save up money, and we want to start investing in these ways. And I told her, that means I don't have as much time. That means there's going to be weekends where I'm going to have to work. Because you and I, with the business, don't make money if we stay at home. Mm -hmm. You have to go out and do the proposals and do the work and do all of that. But we had that conversation together. And for the first time... I felt like we had a plan versus I'm doing this and you have to get used. It was like we both made that decision and there was an understanding that took so much pressure off of me, understanding it was a season. We're not living our life this way, but for the next six months, here's what we're doing because here's what our goal is. Yeah. Well, and it's it's about surrounding yourself with people and it sounds like you have who understand what makes you tick and who are willing to put up with – um, your your flaws. You know, yeah. I, I've been in relationships in the past where, you know, any time I spent outside of the relationship was seen as competitive to the relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, the person I'm, I'm with now, fortunately, she understands that I'm happiest when I'm in motion. That can be work, but she's also good at saying, hey, I get it, work 50 hours, but 60 isn't necessarily better than 50. And yeah, I'm going to stop, you know, being supportive when you're working yourself, yeah. you know, into into the grave. Um, but also, you know, if, I, if I'm true to that, being supportive of the stuff that makes me tick. And, and some of that is acknowledging my faults, yeah. knowing that the relationships I've had 
that have failed in the past, the only thing that I can focus on if I want to make tomorrow better than today is what was my mistake in that? What did I do wrong? Yeah. Not what were the flaws in the other person, but what was I not willing to ask for um, and what was I not willing to do? Mm-hmm. And then trying to get better at that. And it's 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 living through honesty because – like people pleaser all the way through. Mm -hmm. And what happens when you're a people pleaser, when it comes to your relationships, when it comes to work, you put yourself in situations where you're not going to do well. And it extends to the relationship. It extends to the clients. It extends to your boss. It extends to all of these things. So it's like once you're able to step in and say, look, here's what you're buying into if you're rolling with me and understanding Maybe I do need to adjust a little bit, but also you're never going to find someone else who wants to sit down and be at home at five every single night and do these things. And there's a balance. There's a little bit of of tugging there left and right. But once you find something that works, you realize like, wow, this is this is great. And what I've found is when Eliana is so willing to work with me, it makes me so much more willing to also say I could do that Monday. Yeah, it's it's give and take. It's compromise. um, And, you know, it's. Definitely the place where I've learned the most <laughs> through doing things wrong, but it's learning that if you're going to enjoy the benefits of having someone in your life, you're going to have to do some things differently. Yeah. You won't necessarily have to change who you are, but you're going to have to compromise. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, and, and it means saying no to stuff. I mean, one of the great epiphanies I had in 2021 is. You can make the right decision and still feel sad after having made the right decision. Yes. I can say no to stuff, and even though it's the right decision, still feel, you know, like I've lost something. But but work through that and say, okay, greater good is that I said no. It still kind of sucks, but I'm going somewhere better. Yeah. And that's that's hard. I've had to say no to people. I mean, I've I've completely you know changed some relationships in the past year and a half where I said, I'm never going to be able to be who this person wants me to be in this relationship. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have to say no to the relationship. Yeah. And it's hard. But if I want to have the right people in my life, I got to do that. And lessons that you keep learning throughout life. Mm -hmm. There's no point at which you stop learning. I mean, oh yeah, I'm learning (laughs) lessons every day. You're telling me the same thing and it's kind of like, all right, let's compare notes real quick and see how we can continue to grow. Almost all of the training that I do is reminding stuff, people of stuff they already know but need to prioritize. And a lot of it is reminding myself of stuff that I need to prioritize. I tell people in almost every class I teach, I am fellow traveler in this journey. I am Mm -hmm. fellow student in this class. When I say we, I really mean we. Definitely. And the best way to learn something is to proclaim to know what you're talking about in front of other people. And then sometimes (laughs) you get paid for it. Then you have to do the homework. Then you have to do the homework and actually make sure you know what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 So... Lots going on. Mm-hmm. The journey has been super yeah. interesting. What are you up to now? Yeah, so I'm pr- trying to get back to prioritizing my health. That's number one. Mm-hmm. Um, just being more active, eating better. That's goal number one. Because yeah. if I don't do that, I'm getting to an age where I'm not going to have much else if I don't. Number two is prioritizing people. My son and I are actually going to be living together for the first time in a long time for the next six months. He's doing an internship at Design Collaborative, which mm-hmm. happens to be really close to where I live. Yeah. So we're going to be roommates, which would be great because I'll be able to invest some real time with him. Um, prioritizing the right people, continuing down that path. If I could say I had one win in 2021, it was that. It was, yeah, I could look back at relationships. A friend of mine, Jim, my best friend from high school, texted me and said, hey, you know, do you want to want me to come out and visit? And I said, yes. And we had a great, like, four or five days doing more of that, being mm-hmm. there for people, not trying to be there for everyone, but being there for the right people is yeah. number two. Um, Number three is I'm really excited with some stuff that's going on at Asher. We're looking at, we've always been great at doing the work. Mm -hmm. We haven't always been good about the stuff that surrounds the work. Like, you know, we've, we're fortunate. We have really service oriented, hardworking people, but we got to look at stuff like onboarding of new employees. How do we make it people thrilled to be there on day one. Um, Stuff like that, little stuff that makes a big difference. So we're looking at that. And again, my interest at Asher is more legacy. What can I do for other people than how do I get my work done? Um, Point six four, it's really about saying no to the wrong opportunities and saying yes to the right ones. And 
to spend more time outside. Yeah. I know that sounds crazy, but that's where a lot of my energy is. Today was a beautiful day for, you know, we're, we're recording this on, what is it, December 12th? Mm-hmm. And the sun was out and it was 45 degrees. So yep. I went for a walk for an hour and it was one of the better decisions I made today. So, yeah. So that's, those are the priorities. Um, and I'm fortunate that I get to do the thing that I believe I'm uniquely able to do. And I've surrounded myself with a lot of the people who I really am fortunate to have in my life. So it's just making sure I don't screw that up. (laughs) That's really it. Yeah. You and me both. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying yes to this. Yeah. Um, I I was really excited about this because every time you and I talk, there is such a bundle of things that I learn. So being able to share that with the world has been awesome. Well, it's mutual. I appreciate the opportunity. And it's always fun to talk with you. And, you know, my, my hope is that, People who only know my story as someone who's been working for 30 years know that, hey, you know, I'm just like you. I -hmm. have challenges. I've had to overcome things. And it all works out. It really does. (laughs) Well, awesome. Anthony, I hope the next time we see each other, it's outside or doing something Let's do it. Let's do it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. That was great. Yeah, it was great. great. We did great on time. It wasn't bad. Boom.